I'm Ken Anderson. Uh, I was born in 1929, and I came to Red Hook back in, I think it's 76. If there's any place I'd suggest to go, uh, it would be Red Hook, because I think we have one of the nicest little communities that you could find anywhere. I went into the Air Force in 1950. At that time, I uh, uh, volunteered in my services for four years. And during those four years, I experienced uh, what was could, could have possibly turned into a nuclear war. I decided I was going to enlist. And I, I was a little teed off because I tried to enlist in the Navy. My brother was in the Navy, and he was telling me all these naval stories. And, and uh, I said, I guess I'll go in the Navy, too. So I went to the recruiting office in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And I walked into the uh, naval recruiting office, and they turned me down because I wore glasses. So I said, all right, I'm going to go across the hall and I'm going to enlist in the Air Force. And strangely enough, they took me. I started out as a recruit, of course. Started at the bottom. I qualified and and, uh, and got promoted to Staff Sergeant over my career of four years in the Air Force. I was involved in preparing our special planes that we retrofitted to carry the atomic bomb. We completed that particular task using two groups of F-84 fighter planes, each group of 25 planes. And there was always going to be at least one of those planes that would carry the bomb. The rest of them would be carrying what appeared to be the bomb, but they were not live bombs. And I'll tell you now that I did, even though I was in charge of uh, retrofitting these planes to carry the bomb, I had no idea that we were, we were retrofitting to carry the atomic bomb. The F-84 Thunder Jet, it could not carry enough fuel to get it from one position to another. We refueled in midair First time in history, the C-54 tanker planes was a flying gasoline station. We were headed for the, the closest air base that we could fly these tanker planes. And these tanker planes were big planes, big four-motor transport planes. So we, we started out in Albany, Georgia, and we went to Travis Air Force Base in California with a load of fuel. But in this case, we're practicing with water. We were, we were flying in these lumbering, big lumbering transport planes that had a window the size of uh, 10 square inches to look out of. And we still didn't know where we were going. They were keeping it so secret that as far as we knew, we were just out for a ride, only to find out where we went to Hawaii. So we landed in Hawaii using mid-air refueling. Then uh, we left Hawaii, and the next stop was Wake Island. That was a long trip. I remember that distinctly because uh, we were flying, and it seemed like we were flying forever. Can't see anything out the window. Of course, if you could see anything, is all you'd see is water. And at that time, we were able to get out of the transport planes and stretch our legs a little bit. Then we flew from Wake Island to Tokyo. Now, to get across that large expanse of, of water, I had to use mid-air refueling. These were retrofitted bombers, and they had a tail gun. And there was uh, an Air Force guy sitting in this saddle seat in the tail of the airplane. The only thing he could see is out the back end, and it was noisy. And he flew this boom. Coming out the back of the tanker plane was a, a big old gasoline tank. The nozzle and, 
had fins on it. So once they got close enough to each other and they did a lot of practicing to do this, because there's two so-called pilots involved, one in the tanker plane. The, the one plane was about 20 to 30 feet higher in the altitude. In other words, you synchronize the, the speed of these two planes. And you got two planes flying parallel to each other. And uh, once they got themselves positioned, then guide the nozzle to go into the port on the fighter plane who's receiving the fuel. So uh, once you got connected, then you can open the valve. If you spilled a little along the way, it all dissipated in midair. That was the first time in history that mid-air refueling was used. And one, one tanker plane could carry enough fuel to, to refuel, I think, three different fighter jets. Along the way, we lost one plane. Nobody knew where it went. It just disappeared. They didn't have all the electronic gear to locate the plane. Nobody knew where we were going. Uh, the only thing we knew was we were we were told that in Tokyo to get back on a plane because we're not at our destination yet. And we only had to f fly along the edge of the main island. You could look out the window and see the shoreline. And there was only maybe a two or three hour flight along the coastline to get to the base on the main island of Japan. So we landed at... Uh, in northern Japan on the main island of, of Masawa. So our path was Travis Air Force, Hawaii, Wake Island, Masawa. I had a lot of experiences with, this, with the civilian life in Japan. I, I had a lot of respect for, I still have a lot of respect for the people of Japan because they treated me very well. This time we, we ended up in the, in the winter time uh, on the northern island of Japan, and it was cold. I remember we we were living in Quonset huts, and no insulation, just the the metal between being outside and inside. And uh, we were there at Christmas time. I remember uh, we got acquainted with an actually what turned out to be an orphanage of children, Japanese children. We made the arrangement where they would allow about 12 little orphanage kids, probably about seven, year, seven years of age. We took, we took a, the old six-by truck and we drove that into the island and picked up 12 of these orphanage kids and brought them to the base. And we, we gave them a little party, gave them a, a, a gift. I'm not sure how we got the paper, the, but we wrapped up these gifts. Strangely enough, it was a gift of little toy trucks, and they were made in Japan, believe it or not. Fed them a, a typical mess hall meal. And they'd never, these kids had never experienced any American food. They didn't know what to do with it. I remember they didn't express much desire to have to eat that food because they didn't like that. They'd never had mashed potatoes and gravy. That was kind of a nice experience. Uh, the kids enjoyed it. We enjoyed it. I was exposed to real life in the military, but still a secret life. And I never questioned, you know, why we were in Japan. I was very fortunate to have had the experiences that I had.